Uh, hey, we're glad you guys are here today. Um, like Chris said, my name is Adam. I'm on staff here at Journey Point. Um, we're glad that you would choose to spend some of your 4th of July weekend with us. Uh, hopefully you guys have some good fun plans coming up. Hopefully, like you get, maybe hopefully tomorrow off if you're working. Like don't work as hard. It's 4th of July. It's America's birthday. Come on. Uh, but hey, uh, if it is your first time here today, uh, we're so glad that you would join us. Like Pastor Chris said, you can scan that QR code, um, fill that connect card, out, connect card out for us. We would love um, to get connected with you. Also, um, if it is your first time here, you came at a good uh, Sunday. Um, we're kind of in between uh, our series right now. We just finished up uh, with GOAT. Uh, well, the last week, talking about Romans 8, we'll be in a new fun series coming up um, next week as well. Um, but uh, in between, we're kind of talking about some values today uh, of what we have as a church. So if it is your first time here, we're glad that you would choose today because we're going to talk about um, some things that are important in uh, the life of our church. Um, one of those things is that we believe um, that we are better together. Uh, if you've been around for a while, we, we got a nice new Denver West World sign back there, but we, we've had that slogan before, right? The better together in the back. You might have seen that uh, kind of language. Uh, and so um, if you uh, want to take a next step with that, like we are going to honor that. And we want to be alongside of you and do this thing together. So scan that QR code, fill out that next step form, that event form, that serve form, connect group form, whatever it is. Uh, but we're going to talk about um, this idea of togetherness. Uh, again, this is a, a value, not only for us to, to gather together right here on Sundays, but to also do life together um, outside of these walls as well throughout um, the week. So I'm going to ask a question, and like the people that I ask this of, you're going to really hate me for asking this question. You ready? We got any introverts in the house? Come on, introverts. Loud. See, you can do it. It's okay. You can raise your hand. Nobody, nobody's, nobody's judging you for being an introvert. Uh, I know the real introverts in the room didn't even raise their hands. So like, <laughs> just know, I know, I know. Uh, I'm a little weird. Um, I would like to call myself an introverted extrovert. I don't know if that makes any kind of sense. Now, Pastor Chris is an extroverted extrovert, right? Uh, so we got to have a little bit of difference on our team here. So I'm an introverted extrovert. So that's kind of an oxymoron. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. But I like love hanging out with people. I love going to places, experiences, all these kind of things with people. But like I also need to recharge and have my alone time as well. Anybody like that, right? Come on, let's go. Praise the Lord. Uh, and so it's a, it's a little weird. I'm, I'm especially weird because like I can't be like fully alone, right? So I can't like get cooped up in my bedroom, like have like nothing going on, nobody talking to me. So like, I love being alone, but like with people around. That makes no sense. But let me give you some examples. So um, like walking downtown Denver, I love it. I pop in my headphones, I'm walking around, I'm like alone, but I got people around me. Like you feel like you're in a movie almost, right? Uh, going to coffee shops, I love it. I'll even like, I'm not above it. I'll go, I'll go eat in a restaurant alone. I don't care. Uh, does anybody remember Movie Pass? Anybody, college students, if you're in college, yeah, Seth does. Uh, Movie Pass was like a horrible idea, but it was great for like the month that it was a thing. It was like you could buy a little card and get unlimited movies anytime. So I would literally go and just watch a movie by myself, right? I loved it. Um, also, yeah, it was great. It was great. Um, also, uh, like an airport, like I love going to the airport alone. I love traveling alone. I'm the weirdo that gets there like two hours extra early to like just people watch at the airport. So I'm an introverted extrovert. Um, and uh, I also like, this is a safe space this morning, right? I secretly love when plans get canceled. Anybody like, is that weird? Anybody like, like sometimes like, yes. So like the inner extrovert in me wants to say yes to everything, right? If somebody asks me to do something, I'll like, I'm down to go do it. But the inner introvert in me is like, do we really want to go do that, right? Do I really want to, to go uh, do this? And uh, I don't know if anyone in here is like that, um, but there's just something about when somebody makes plans and I say yes, and I, I don't really want to go, um, and they cancel with like 30 minutes to go, and I just text back. I'm like, oh man, dude, I was looking forward to that. We'll, we'll get them next time. And then secretly, I'm like the fist bump. I get my blanket. I get to my couch. I binge watch Netflix, right? That, there's just something about that. Um, but I've also been in that situation where like, I, I don't want to go, but I've said yes, but I end up going and I have a great time. Uh, I've, that's happened in my life so many times, right? I don't really want to go to this plan, but, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through with it. And at the end of the night, like, I'm like, man, that was so great. I'm glad I did that. Uh, I, I, I don't regret not going. Uh, maybe you have something like that coming up this week. Maybe there's a 4th of July party or picnic or cookout or barbecue uh, that you really don't want to go to. I just want to encourage you to go. You're going to have a great time. I promise it's going to be worth it. Um, but I think that we have such a good time 
at some events that are planned that maybe we don't want to go to at first. I think we end up having a, a good time uh, because I think and believe, and we as a church believe, that we were made for community. We were made for community. We were made to do this life together. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't always need to be together all the time, right? We need our alone time. We see even in, uh, in Jesus' life, he gets away often. He gets alone often to go be uh, with God the Father. So it doesn't mean that we need to only always be together all the time. We need that alone time. But it doesn't mean that we, we need each other um, in order um, to live and thrive in the life that God has for us as a community, as a body of believers. And so we're going to be in uh, Philippians 2 today. Philippians 2, if you have a Bible with you, and I hope you do, turn, to, turn with me there to Philippians 2. You can also scan that QR code, and, and it'll pull up the scripture reading for the day. Pastor Chris mentioned it, but your best way to get connected with us is to scan that QR code um, and join in on, on the things that are going on here. So that'll be up there. We'll also have um, the, the words up, the, the scripture up on the screen for you. Um, as you're turning there, though, a little bit of backstory of Philippians. Uh, Philippians was written by Paul, who was an apostle. He wrote most of uh, the New Testament, what we know as the New Testament. And where fa Paul finds himself in Philippians is not the most ideal place in the world, uh, and that is jail, right? There's a lot of places I can find myself. Jail is not one of them that I particularly want to find myself in, right? Paul finds himself in, in jail, um, and he's literally shackled up. But ironically, Paul writes some of the most liberating ideas that we can have as, as followers of Jesus in Philippians. Uh, he's writing to the church um, in Philippi, uh, which actually, in my research this week, I didn't know this, but the church in Philippi, uh, it says, was one of, if not the first church ever planted in Europe. So that's pretty cool to, to look into, right? One of the first ever church plants, if not the first church plant uh, in Europe. He's writing uh, this letter about 11 years after the church of Philippi was planted. Um, in the first chapter, Paul uh, he thanks them for their uh, friendship. He states to them that he is thinking of them often, right? Um, he's pretty much assuring them, like, don't worry about me. I'm, like, shackled up. I'm in chains. But, like, the gospel of Jesus is getting proclaimed. Uh, he even says, like, the guards are coming to, like, know Jesus, which I can just imagine, like, those poor imperial guards just having to hear Paul talk about Jesus 24-7, right? He's like, joke's on you. I'm going to share Jesus nonstop, right? So that's where we find ourselves in Philippians 2. Um, also in this chapter, um, Paul's addressing some things that the Philippians are walking through. They're uh, kind of struggling, really, with a lot of out uh, outside external noise coming in. They're being persecuted. They're being chastised for their faith. All of these things that are coming from the outside. Uh, and Paul tells them that the best way to deal with this is through humility. So we're going to talk about humility today and what that means for us uh, as a body. But before we read chapter 2, uh, let me pray real quick and then we'll dive into the Word. God, you are good. Father, we thank you that we get to come together and just worship and proclaim your name. And Jesus, as we just sang not long ago, in the midst of whatever we're going through, we can call on you, we can speak your name, Jesus, and we know that you are right here with us. And so we thank you for that. Um, we thank you for um, giving us uh, your word to, to read, and I pray that um, you speak to us in a way that only you can as we dive into uh, what you have for us today. Um, bless the rest of this time for us together, and let us go out encouraged by you uh, and sharing your name uh, to our city that needs to hear. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Philippians 2. If you're ready with me, just say ready today. Ready. ready. I'm ready. Let's go. Verse 1 says this in Philippians 2. It says, if then... There is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking in the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, and intent on one purpose. Verse 3 says, do nothing, say nothing, nothing. out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in what? Humility. Humility. Consider others as more important than yourselves. And finally, verse 4 says this. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. And so I believe as we look at these four verses today, um, there's three aspects of humility when we look into Philippians 2. And the first is this. Humility first provides unity. Humility provides unity. And when we talk about unity we have to understand that it begins right here in this room. Unity begins with the church. That begins with a sold-out group of, of followers of Jesus striving towards unity 
every day. So often, I believe that we as a, a big C church, a, a global church, right, can let a lot of the world know what we're against rather than what we are for. But what should the church look like? What should bought-in Christians look like? What does that mean? What should we be unified for, right? What are the things that we should stand on? Well, Paul actually addresses that. He does a, a beautiful job in the opening of Philippians 2 and opening uh, the chapter with a bunch of rhetorical questions. And so we're going to look through them. Um, he asks a lot of things. He does this often in his writing. He uses a lot of if-then statements, right? We see that often from him. Um, knowing the answers to the questions is pretty obvious, right? He just does it to kind of reiterate the point. Uh, and so the first off, he asks uh, the question of if there is any encouragement in Christ. That is the first thing that, that he uh, questions, right? He says if there is any encouragement with Christ. A life with Christ is full of encouragement. We will be encouraged by Jesus as we walk through this life with him. We need to be encouraged, quite frankly, if we're going uh, to live this Jesus life. And we see time and time again, and even in scripture, how Jesus like, encourages those that are walking around him, that he is meeting, that he is engaging with. He humbly asks them to follow him, and he tells them, hey, this life that you're living, like die to that life and live in a new life in me. But it's, it's not in a demeaning or a belittling way. It's in a, it's in a way of encouragement. Jesus tells people to, to change their life, not because he hates them as a person, but he says, I've got something better for you in store. We're going to be encouraged if we live uh, this life um, with Christ. And now, how much more if, if you have said yes to Jesus, now that you have him on your side, does he in, encourage you and walk with you in every aspect uh, of life? Paul knows what he's doing and asking these rhetorical questions. He's just reminding the Philippians here of who it is they can believe in and who it is they can trust. The second rhetorical question he asks is this. He says, if there's any consolation of love, any consolation of love. So not only does, does Christ encourage us, but he also comforts us. Or, or what scripture says here, he consoles us. And this goes beyond just like the comfy, feel-good feeling that we have, that, that I have when a plane gets canceled and I get my blankie and go watch Netflix, right? But more, more so than that, more so than just a, a comfortable, comfy kind of feeling. Consolation of love in this context, Paul is writing here, he's actually saying Christ encourages us and he strengthens us to face whatever is coming our way. He's saying to the Philippians here, hey, there's a lot of things going on. You feel like maybe your walls are caving in on you. You have this consolation of love in Christ, though, if you have said yes to him to be able to strengthen you and to face whatever comes your way. The love of Christ comforts us and consoles us in a way that nothing else can. And the third thing that Paul states is this. He says, if there is any fellowship in the spirit, any fellowship in the spirit. Now, this goes beyond just being encouraged. It goes beyond just having the, the consolation of love of, of Jesus. But uh, now there's, it's on us a little bit, right? This requires action from us. There's a difference now. There's a, there's a step that we need to take. Uh, I looked up the Greek meaning for fellowship uh, in this context of what Paul is uh, writing. And he says this, the Greek meaning for fellowship uh, is the sharing of things in common for a common goal. The sharing of things in common for a common goal. Paul is saying if we have said yes to Jesus, we're going to be in fellowship with him. What does that mean? We're going to be on mission with him. We're going to take steps with him. We're not just going to sit back and let him do all the work, but we're going to be actively on mission and in fellowship with the Spirit. But not only that, we need to be in fellowship and on mission together in the room uh, as well with one another. Finally, Paul says this, the last of the four rhetoricals. He says, if there's any affection and mercy, any affection and mercy. When we have said yes to Jesus, we are bought into his plans and his purposes for our life. Like if we have done that, we're going to experience an affection and mercy from him like we never knew we could. And Paul lists these four rhetorical questions again, I think for a very specific reason, right? Um, he could have just gone in like right at verse two and just says like, hey, be unified, like go do it, right? Um, but he does this for a very specific reason. He wants to reiterate to the church in Philippi how transformed their lives ought to look now that they have said yes to Jesus. Uh, a commentary I read this week uh, put it this way, talking about these four rhetoricals that, that Paul says. Uh, it says this, Paul mentioned these questions in a matter that suggests to us that they should be all obvious parts of the Christian's experience. To make his rhetorical point, he could have just as e easily said, uh, if water is wet, if fire is hot, if rocks are hard, 
and so on and so forth. And because of these things, we need to humbly seek unity. Unity is, is the goal in all that we want to do um, as a church. If you've been uh, around me uh, for some time, you'll know that I'm a huge basketball fan. I love the game of basketball. I love watching basketball. I love playing basketball. I love talking about basketball. I love everything about it, right? I love the things that, that pro ball players can do that just like us mortal humans can't do, right? Uh, I love it, right? I, I wanted to be in the NBA for a long time. I think by the time I was like 15 or 16, I think my dad had to graciously sit me down and say, Hey, bro, you're like 5'11 with a, with a 10-inch vertical. I don't think it's in the cards for you, right? But I love, I love the game of basketball. And so in thinking through um, unity, I just like, couldn't help but think of some of the most like, unified teams that, that we know of from like, historic, historically great uh, teams in the NBA. I think of the Showtime Lakers, right, with Magic. Come on. 96 Bulls, greatest, I think, team of all time with MJ and Scotty and all those guys. The, the 2003 Spurs with Tim Duncan, Mr. Fundamental, right? Beautiful basketball. 2015 Warriors, you got the Splash Bros, Steph and Clay, and you got Draymond there as well. The 2023 NBA champion, Denver Nuggets. Come on. That's a unified team right there. These teams all had unity that leads to their beautiful style of basketball. It stems from humility. It stems from humility. They make the extra pass. They do the right thing. They count somebody else on their team as, as more important than uh, themselves. One of my uh, favorite quotes uh, from Nikola Jokic uh, actually came this season. Uh, a reporter was asking him early on. It was during his like crazy run. He's had a lot of them, right? Putting up historical numbers, doing things that nobody else has, has really done in the league before. Uh, and the reporter was asking him questions about some of those historical numbers um, that he was putting up. And he asked him, I'll never forget, he, he asked him, what was more satisfying? Getting a whole bunch of points, right? Dropping 50 on somebody, which is fun to do. I'd like to do that selfishly. Or racking up a whole bunch of assists and rebounds. And without hesitation, Jokic said, assists. Assists. Didn't even think about it. And the reporter asked why, and he responded with a simple answer. Jokic said, points make one person happy, but assists make two people happy. Right? We can celebrate the basket together when I make an assist to my teammate. Two people can celebrate the goal. We must humbly celebrate one another if we want to have unity together. Paul says later now in, in verse 2 to actively think in the same way, love the same way, be united in the same spirit, and have the same purpose. We need to, to see the goal and go for it. And, and what is the goal? What are, we, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to do each and every Sunday here? The goal is to have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ and to lead others to that intimacy and relationship with him as well. That's what we're going to do in everything that we do here. If we're not ultimately doing something that's pointing ourselves and other people to Jesus as well, we're not going to do it. That is the goal that we need to have. We need to be uniform in that goal if we want to see our city change. Humility brings up unity. The second truth today is this. Humility trumps comparison. Humility trumps compa comparison. I think when success happens, when we are unified, think of those great historic teams, right? Success is going to happen. Naturally, there's going to be some comparisons that start to come um, around with one another. It's also, in this day and age, so easy to, to have comparisons in our life, right? With the fact that we can just follow anywhere from any time around the world at any moment on our, on our phones in our same sphere, right? It's easy to fall into comparison in this day and age. And Paul actively warns against this. He says this in, in verse 3, that we need to combat this spirit of comparison. He says, do nothing, say nothing, I didn't have to translate that one in Greek. I'm pretty sure nothing means nothing, right? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others more important out of yourselves. And it's important to note here, like I was, I was reading and, and looking in and all this kind of stuff, it's, it's important to note here that, that Paul says what? Do nothing out of selfish ambition, right? Not just do nothing out of ambition. Paul's not saying don't be ambitious, right? It's good to have ambitions. It's actually great to have godly ambitions, right? And, and he has things for us to, to live out and lead out and achieve for uh, his glory. But I think far too often we can get that selfish in there a little bit. 
We can let our ambitions get focused solely on what we are trying to do. We have to constantly, constantly look for this in our lives. I'm constantly asking myself, like, who am I doing this for? Wh- whose kingdom am I doing this for? Am I, am I doing this for God's kingdom or am I doing it for Adam's kingdom? Only one of those kingdoms is going to last forever. And spoiler alert, it's not going to be Adam's, right? We have to ask ourselves, whose kingdom am I doing this for? Paul says a, a self Selfish ambition leads to what's called conceit. Uh, I looked up the definition of conceit, uh, and in the dictionary it defines it as this. Conceit is an excessively favorable opinion, opinion of one's own ability, importance, wit, and so forth. An excessively favorable opinion of one's own ability, importance, wit, and so forth. This actively combats humility. And this also brings in comparisons. I said a, a second ago, but in the age of social media, right, it's like so easy just to look at in my life, other churches, other influencers, other people in my same sphere, and just think, man, if I could just get to like, if I could get some of that, like I'd be killing it for the kingdom of God. But that is such a selfish mindset. That's really only wanting to boost my kingdom. And you know what? Like all of those accounts that we all follow online and on social, whatever it is, whatever person you follow, whatever influence you might follow, whatever organization in your same sphere that you might follow, like they're only posting the very best of what they have in their life, right? They're, they're not hiding or they're, they're hiding all of the things that, that we're going through that we don't want to admit. Every single account that we follow on social media has different hardships that they're walking through that they would like never post online, right? And so we, we can't compare to some of those things, but we also can't compare to one another in this room. We have to watch out for comparisons in this room to look and say, I don't, I don't want to have a spirit of like, how do I stack up to this person or that person or them over there, right? We, we cannot have a spirit of comparison with one another in this room as well. This needs to be the safest place that we come to each and every week. We want to be a place of encouragement and unity and what we'll talk about in just a moment, a a place of honor. That's what we want this place to to be. And that's what we want to build our foundation on because that's what we see Jesus do in his life. And when we humble ourselves, I really believe that we won't compare. I was thinking of, of ways that I try to combat comparison in my life because it, it happens so often, right? And I think in my life, I, I want to challenge you guys to do this as well. Whenever I, I tend to start to compare, I try to actively combat that with just thanking God for something, right? When I have a, when I have a spirit of, of thankfulness, then I'm going to release some of that spirit of comparison. Like when I thank God for the people that I do get to be in my life with, the, the things that I do have in this life, man, the comparison immediately starts to fade. And so combat your spirit of comparison with a spirit of thankfulness. I promise you, if you're spending time thanking God for things and releasing some of the things that you really want to Him, you're going to lose that spirit of comparison. You're going to thank God for the things that you do have. Which leads to the last point today. We want to be a church um, that is unified. We don't want to be a church that's always comparing to one another. And lastly, we want to be a church that prioritizes honor. Because humility, we see, prioritizes honor. I did a lot of like I was just reading the dictionary all all week this week. I looked up a lot of definitions, so I got one more for you for honor. Uh, Dictionary definition for honor is this. It's simple. It can be defined as this. To regard with a great respect and hold in high esteem. To regard with a great respect and hold in high esteem. And this is actually a a verb, right? There's a lot of different um, ways that we can can talk about honor, right? Someone can have the honor or distinction. You can feel honored, right? But I want to read this definition for you again and think of it as a verb. Because honor, what we want to do here is actually an action step. So read it with me this way and think through it of a verb. To regard with a great respect and to hold in high esteem. This is an action that we can choose to do. I think Paul speaks to this in an even better way in verse 4. Uh, he says this, Everyone should look not only to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. If we can humble ourselves, it's going to be so much easier to celebrate and to honor others. We must have a spirit of honor and of lifting each other up and of edifying one another and spurring one another on. That's the, that's the idea of honor when we talk about it here as um, a church. And again, notice here as well, 
Paul says everyone should look not only to his own interest. I think of the same way with ambition, right? It's okay to have interests, right? God has given us things that, that we're passionate about, that we want to, to talk about. Uh, we each have our own interests in our lives. And Paul's saying, don't just disregard all of your interests. He says, everyone should look not only to his own interests. He's saying, look to the interests of others. Celebrate the good times of people. Grieve in the hard times of people. Care about what other people are going through all while looking to Jesus. Which leads me to my uh, kind of final question today. Uh, as Campbell and the team uh, come back up in just a moment, I want to ask one final question as they get ready to come up. And it's kind of a real question, and it's kind of one that, that I think we've all, quite frankly, had in our lives. And that question is this. Like, why should we seek humility? Why should we actually seek humility? Why should we be unified? Why should we avoid comparisons? Why should we prioritize honor? Like, isn't it like so much easier just to do things on my own? Isn't it so much easier to pop in those headphones and walk downtown and be alone and do all that kind of stuff, right? That, that could be so much easier, right? People are messy. People are hard to deal with. People are annoying. Why should I always actively seek community and unity and humility? My simple answer to that, you're going to hate it. It's a Sunday school answer, but it's because that's what Jesus did. Verse 5 says this. I want to read this. Verse 5 says, adopt the same attitude as that of Jesus Christ, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. Verse 9, for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. For at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is the model in all that we do. And despite being perfect, despite being the king of kings and the name above every name, he was literally seated at the right hand of, of the Father for eternity he humbled himself, and he chose to die for you and I. Not only did he choose to die, but it says he humbled himself to death even to the point of the cross. The cross was the most humiliating way that the Romans could think of to, to murder somebody and kill them, right? It was the most humiliating thing way in Jesus uh, that, could, that he could have died with, and yet he took on that cross despite the shame, and he died for you and me. Because he loves us more than we can ever know. And if Jesus, who is perfect and who is eternal, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, if he can humble himself, I think you and I can as well. And Jesus took on the cross and he's offering these four rhetoricals today that we're going to put back up. He's offering you today a life that can be lived in these four aspects. A life of encouragement in him, a life of consolation in him, a life of fellowship and worship with him, and finally a life of affection and mercy in him. And if you haven't said yes to Jesus, you can experience all of these things right now, today. Do not get that wrong before leaving today. Scan that QR code, check that connect card that says, today I said yes to Jesus for the first time. And I promise you, if you do that, if you give your life to him, you'll experience these four aspects in a way that you never knew you could. Lastly, if you're in the room today and you are a follower of Jesus and you've said yes to him, I just, I want to challenge you to, to ask yourself if you're living in these four ways. Do people see encouragement from you? Do people find consolation in you? And do you have a comforting spirit for others? Are you in fellowship with others on mission for the same purpose? Do people look at you and they say, I know what that person's for, not what they're against. That person has affection and mercy, and I know I can come to them. 
ask yourself, are you doing these things for others as Christ is doing for you? And church, we must be unified. We must get this right. Because believe it or not, the world is watching. Jesus tells us that the world will know his love for them by the love that we have for one another. And so a way to show people the love of Christ is to make sure we got each other's backs in here, to be unified together on mission for a purpose. And so I want to challenge us today before we sing our last song of just how we can take that next step in unity. I want you guys to, to even look around the room if you'd like. Like, find somebody. Who's somebody's face that you know, but you never really talked to them, you don't even know their name? Like, I want to challenge you. Meet somebody new today. Maybe uh, there's someone in the room that you talk to every single Sunday, right? But it's for like two seconds, small talk at the coffee table, then you come inside and you kind of just say, how was your week? Mom was good. How was yours? Good. And, and that's that, right? Who's someone that, that you might even know in the room today that you can actively seek to step into a little bit deeper intentional relationship with? Somebody you can grab coffee with or a lunch with this week. We need to walk together in unity. That's my, my challenge for us today. How can we do life together outside of these walls on a Sunday morning? And more importantly, who do we know that desperately needs to hear the gospel of Jesus? That desperately needs to feel the unity that you and I get to have? We all have somebody. Who is your one that you're going to talk about and engage with, to bring them in, to experience what you and I can experience in Jesus. Take a few moments, ask yourself, in what ways can I grow in unity with these four rhetorical questions that Paul gives us? And I'll pray us out and we'll sing one more song. Take a few moments to do that. we thank you that you humbled yourself for us you didn't have to do it but you did it because of your love for us and Lord we want to live a life that reflects you and that honors you and that lifts you up and so Jesus we need to get this right we need to be unified we need to have a spirit of humility with one another and with the world Father Would you teach us and guide us and mold us into humility? Would you remind us that we can be encouraged in walking with you and not discouraged? Would you remind us that you are walking with us in every step that we take? Father, let us see those that are in front of us. Let us not just be walk buyers or passer buyers, but let us just see the needs that are all around us, Father. And to, in humility, Lord, show them who you are and serve them. Father, we can do nothing apart from you. We can try to be as unified as we want to be as a church, Lord, but we know without you, it's in vain. So we ask that you breathe through each of us, that you speak through each of us, that you walk through uh, and walk with and walk alongside each of us as we seek unity together. You are the God that unifies, and we can thank you for that. So we just pray that you continue to do a work that only you can in our city because it desperately needs you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen.